Greetings, everyone. My name is Murtaza Haider, and um, I'm delighted to make this presentation on digital economy, especially the information and communication technologies in Canada. Um, and I'm doing this for the Shenyang University of Technology. And um, I hope uh, that this conversation, brief it is, um, uh, but it uh, will be, you'll find it useful. And the way I will progress is that I will share my slides um, on, this, on this screen with you. And then I will uh, make this presentation. And I hope that the organizers are able to convert uh, this into, um, into a language that is convenient for you to understand. Um, but um, this presentation will be in English. So the starting point will be that I will share uh, my screen, which I'm going to do now. So if you allow me a second to share my screen, and what you should see on your screen is the uh, my presentation, which says digital economy. Um, so the way I will work uh, in is that um, I will start with an introduction, um, my own introduction, then a brief history of how did we get to this digital economy? Because there's a path that we have taken over the years, uh, over centuries or millennia. And then what is this digital revolution? And 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 more importantly, where we are with generative artificial intelligence and uh, the promises and the challenges that we face. So that would be the, the focus of this conversation. Um, by way of introduction, my name is Murtaza Haider, as I said earlier. I'm a professor of real estate management and data science. So I teach um, um, forecasting. Um, in addition, I'm also the associate dean of um, uh, graduate programs. So I run the MBA and the Masters of Science in Management and the PhD programs. And if you are interested in, in pursuing graduate degrees, uh, now is a good time to reach out to us because we will be running international admissions between now and, and, and early January. Uh, so I'm a professor, I'm an associate dean, I'm also an author with IBM. Um, I published a book called Getting Started with Data Science. It was about 10 years ago or nine years ago. And I continue to work in this area of big data and data science. So now with the introduction on the side, let me take you first to um, how we got, and I'm not going to take like for, for audience in China, history is tens of thousands, thousands of years. It's a more than one millennia, but we will start our journey in the 1760s. And we're going to look at the first industrial revolution and kind of very briefly in three slides get to digital digital age. Now, what happened? We had the steam engines come in. Uh, you could see steam engines, um, mechanization of agriculture and early manufacturing. That's the earliest things that from um, the, the agriculture predominantly benefited from it because of the the way it was mechanized. But in, in, the, in the transportation and in factories, people were able to use the steam engine to be more productive. And that was the first phase of industrial revolution. And there were tons of transformation that happened. And also what happened is that people started to leave rural areas to cities. This rural to urban migration started. And then again, slightly shift, some shifts that started to change trade patterns globally, the silk route and the spice route and other things that, that got expedited in this area. We had a tremendous workforce transition. Uh, people were moving from a primarily agriculture-based economy to slowly an industrial economy. And that happened um, in, from 1760s to 1840s. Then the second industrial revolution came and that's starting, let's say in 1870s to the earlier earliest parts of the 20th century, right before the First World War. And that's where we see the biggest change, and that's electrification. You know, we were able to use electricity for, um, for a variety of reasons, but more importantly, for production and manufacturing. And then um, discovered steel um, and massive steel production, and, and then at the same time, mass manufacturing, making th things in bulk, so factories, and, and um, were able to produce uh, massive amounts of goods and services that that brought the cost down. And then again, those who were good in manufacturing were able to develop their competitive advantage. At the same time, we saw the earliest stages of rise of transportation, both for per uh, personal purposes. People were able to sit in a trolley, um, steam driven, or then even electrified trolleys and buses, and were able to go longer distances. So we could see the cities expand and the infrastructure, especially transportation, made our cities grow significantly. And that started to happen only in the early, early 20th century. We saw tremendous growth in railway networks, especially in Canada, because the eastern part of Canada and the western part of Canada is very much like China. There are thousands of kilometers in between. So that that change, um, that change in accessibility was made possible during that era. 
And then the third industrial revolution then, and that's from the 1960s to the 20th century. And for most audience, and I believe the people who are listening to me are, are young university students, this is something that just happened right before you were born. And that is the introduction of computers, microprocessors and telecommunications. When I went to university and I went to university right next to China and Pakistan, I grew up there and I went to university there. At my university, there were hardly any computers. And this is the, I would say late 80s. And we had a computer room. That's where you would go and work with computers if you had to do something with computer. And now I go back to the same university at times. And then I walk into a lecture hall and everyone has a laptop. Everyone has a cell phone. So this ubiquitous use and availability of technology became only possible um, right before right before you. And if I'm believing if you're millennials right before you were born or around that time. But what has it done? It has done tremendous amount of innovations. The automation in manufacturing um, is something that um, the, for the, the, the big manufacturers were able to automate. Um, in Japan, they were able to use robotics um, and the production capacity and the ability of individual uh, increase significantly. And especially in China, if you could see the Chinese uh, manufacturing capacity, um, that also increased between in the same period between 1980s and, and moving forward, so much so that anything that you buy now in North America or Europe, almost every other thing is made in China. And that is to the uh, use of these technologies, mass manufacturing, and the ability to reduce the cost of production. And at the same time, uh, it benefited from massive advances in logistics, especially the discovery of containers and the containerized shipping made it possible uh, to have a global uh, trading system. And so you can manufacture something thousands of miles away, put it in a container and have it shipped in, in no time. And you could also see the large ships came about. Um, I'm not talking about de in detail about it, but you could, you could see that the containerized shipping uh, from say 2000 containers to 4000 containers to big ships like Emma can carry 16,000 containers. You could see the whole industry transformed around it. What happened at the same time is that because of the computers and everything else, you could see this digital economy emerging. So instead of uh, seeing everything being made on a factory floor, you could see new products. So Facebooks of the world created a new economy. The Googles or alphabets of the world created a new economy. So you have TikTok, Facebook, Alibaba. All of these were a result of digital economy, which meant that the GDP or the total economy's share of manufacturing, manufacturing shares of, of the of the of the total economy, that started to shrink as well. And recently I attended a workshop or seminar from our a very famous Canadian economist, Benjamin Tall. And this is his slide that shows, and if I can point through my cursor, if you could follow the cursor, from 1960s onwards, you could see a significant decline in manufacturing. And that predates NAFTA. NAFTA is the North uh, America Free Trade, Trade Agreement. Many people believe that that led to the manufacturing decline, but no, it, that decline was happening because of the technology and the digitization of the economy that happened. And then you could see that China joined World Trade Organization in 2000, and you could see the manufacturing in North America, not just in everywhere, but North America, especially America, continued to decline. It has plateaued a bit. It may go up, and again, a lot depends upon what happens in the U.S. elections on November 5. It's a new trade and tariff regime that will determine um, if manufacturing will ever go up, but I don't think it will because it didn't decline because of tariffs, it declined for competitive advantage. So now this was a, the preamble. Uh, now we are here um, at the digital revolution and that's really the focus of this conversation. And what I will do is I will present this, this uh, shift from mid 1990s to present. And then I will present to you some, some charts and graphs that show the Canadian picture. Now, what is what are the developments? Um, you could see the impact of the internet and digital communications everywhere. Now, I was in China um, a few years ago, probably in 2018, um, and, and I was amazed uh, at the the way the economy has digitized in, in China. In fact, um, it may not be a surprise to you that the Chinese economy is more digitized than the Canadian economy. We still go to shops and pay with cash and credit cards, but we could see that when I was in China, everybody was paying through digitally. The entire economy has transported itself from cash and credit cards and whatnot to digital and digital payments. So we haven't done that here, but it's already there in China. So 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 when I talk about digital economy, um, I'm not is I'm I'm actually speaking to you with the full knowledge 
of the extent of technology and digitization that has already taken place in China and the way China is leading. But at the same time, this is just a, the, the context of it. What has happened is that the availability of the internet and digital communications created new product services, demand for new services. I mean, who knew that we needed TikTok? Who knew that we needed to have friends on Facebook? And when I was growing up um, in university and colleges, there was no TikTok, there was no Facebook. In fact, we spent a lot of good time with books and, and, and actually real friends. But again, transformations have happened, digital technologies have come in, and now people are more uh, more living on, on in the digital space. Um, I remember in China, wherever we I went and I saw people just taking selfies and posting it and, and commenting on it, and it's a universal phenomenon. But that creates products, that creates demand for goods. If you wanna take a selfie, you need a cell phone, um, and cell phone with a good camera, and if a better camera comes in and a newer cell phone, then you have to upgrade it. So there you could see how digital technology creates a demand and not necessarily a demand for services that you desperately need or you must have, but at least it creates a stream of commerce. And that is what is running our lives these days. The TikToks of the world, the Facebooks of the world, um, Instagram. So everyone now this generation is on Instagram. The question is, if it were just for fun, then yes, it wasn't a big deal, but it's not just for fun. There is a lot of things happening here. And what are those things that, that are happening? The, 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 those who would like to sell things to you, uh, you, because at the end of the day, you and I are consumers. So those who are interested in reaching out to us, they use these digital economy platforms to reach out to customers and not just the, just to reach out to customers. Then there are companies like um, uh, uh, Amazon, which actually now fully is a digital company, which it didn't start as a digital company. It had a claim of being digital first, but it was still being faxed. You you place an order and it will be printed and faxed to the to the warehouse and, and then shipped. This was like 30 years ago, but now it's a fully digital company. It has become a platform um, in itself that it's a, it's a store of stores. It's a mega mall of mega malls. Um, and it's all become possible because of digital um, technology. So e-commerce is slowly increasing. Um, in Canada, I think it's much more prevalent in China. And the digital services at the percentage of GDP are also growing. So I'm gonna show you some numbers and it's rather a statistical profile so that there's some context to our conversation. So um, again, when I say these numbers, I'm, I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that these numbers would be very small relative to what you are used to. I mean, China is a country of over a billion people. Canada is a country of just 40 million people. So everything in relative terms is, is small. I was in, uh, I was in uh, uh, Nanning um, in China. And, and 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 the very week that I was in Nanning, there was a story about Nanning in the Economist magazine that comes out from England. And it said that Nanning is a small town. And I, I couldn't believe it because I was at that time in Nanning running around and I couldn't believe that this was a town of about five to seven million people. Uh, so in China, in fact, something five to seven million is small. In Canada, we think of it as a big mega city. So Shanghai is about 28, 30 million. Beijing is, um, are, are very large cities. So from that scale, you, you have to re recognize that Canada is much, much smaller. So these numbers, so this is the contribution of uh, information and communication technologies, sort of your, your digital economy. So they are in, in, in the contribution to GDP is about $104 billion. Um, if you look at this number here, $104 billion in 2021, it's about $110 billion probably now around that, that number. So what does it tell you? It tells you that there's a path that even um, with the... Um, the prevalence of digital technology in 2007, you could still see a growth that the Canadian economy is a bigger share of, of Canadian economy is now accounted for by digital technologies, mostly ICT, information communication technologies. Uh, so what happens then when this happens, you also see that a larger segment of the population, the workforce or the labor force is involved in that particular field. And what is that particular field? It's the information communication technology. So in 2007, we have about half a million people, 525,000 Canadian workers were employed in ICTs. But by 2021, that number was 717,000. So you could see that the workforce involved in digital technologies is also growing as, as, the, as the sector is growing. 
Now, um, if, if you're not familiar with, with Canada, um, I just want to make sure that there's this some spatial context of this conversation. Um, Canada has three very populous or, or four populous provinces and the rest are very small. Um, so uh, the largest province is Ontario. And if you look at 2021, the, um, the output in billions of dollars is mostly from Ontario. Almost half of the ICT output comes out from Ontario. And Ontario is about 15 million people. And then the second largest or most second most populous province is Quebec. And Quebec, you could see, is the second biggest contributor to the, to the ICT or digital economy. And following Quebec is British Columbia, and which is, you can see in gray, and you could see that the, the, their contribution is even smaller, and following British Columbia is Alberta. And then after Alberta, so if you look at the four big provinces, um, uh, Ontario, Quebec, British Columbia, and uh, Alberta, after that, you could see that the rest of the provinces are very small. So New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, these are provinces with less than a million people living there. So their contribution obviously would be small. The market size is small. And we have a province called Prince Edward Island, which has roughly a population of 200, I think 250,000 people, but you would be surprised to know because they're smaller towns or villages, probably in China with 250,000 people. We have a province with just 250,000 people. So it's a very sparsely populated country, Canada, but bulk of economic activity is concentrated in Ontario, Quebec, British Columbia, and Alberta. So if you're thinking about information technology, where it is, where the workforce is, where the innovations are, where the products and consumers are, they're concentrated in just four provinces. And within those four provinces, actually we're talking about maybe three or four cities or maybe five cities. And that's Toronto in Ontario, Montreal in Quebec, Vancouver in, in British Columbia, and Calgary and Edmonton in Alberta. So if you look at this, these together, Toronto 7 million, um, Vancouver 3 million, Montreal 4 million, and together Calgary and Edmonton about a million each, so 2 million there. So seven plus four plus three, um, 11, 14, 15. So half of Canada you can see is in four cities. The, the half of Canadian population you can account for in the four city regions. So what does it mean that the ICTs or technology or digital economy is also concentrated in just four cities? If you look at the next slide, um, this is the uh, revenue in Canada from 2007 to 2021. And this is basically where is the technology, where is the money coming from, right? Is it such cell phones or whatnot? It's actually software and computer services. So the bulk of the, the revenue that is being generated by the industry is in, um, is in software and computer services, and then following by communication services. So communication services would be cell phones and whatnot. And then information ICT wholesaling is basically when this is a B2B business to business commerce. And then manufacturing is a very small part. This red at the top of my slide, this is the manufacturing. So the manufacturing is a very small slice of the revenue. The bigger slice is just software and computer services. Basically, products are computer software uh, or providing services to support um, computer infrastructure or hardware. And if you look at the, the trends that are um, changing. Um, so as with the digital economy rising, with the ICT rising, you could see some other industry, traditional uh, revenue generating industries are faltering. So this is the pay TV operating revenue. You could see that it was growing all the way up to 2013. And then as more and more digitization happens, you could see the pay TV revenue declines. And if I were to stretch this from 2022 onwards, you could see that number is getting, getting smaller. So the revenue is shifting from the traditional models of communication that was television, that was printed newspapers, this is all shifting towards digital economy. And the transformation here is obvious, but I, I must admit that I've seen this transformation more drastic and rapid in China. Now, if you look at the revenue from telecommunications, um, you want to see um, which within within tel the telephony market, um, the bulk of the revenue, if you look at this light blue at the bottom, it's wireless. Um, and again, it, Canada was one of the first countries to, to be um, to implement landlines. And actually, that was a good thing in the beginning, but became a bad thing in the end, because the transformation from landlines to wireless 
was much, much slower in Canada than other places because they had invested so much over the 100 years being very first in telecommunication with landlines. They were sort of slow in adapting to the new world of wireless community. And we still, I believe, were slow to adopt 5G when Europe and other places in Asia had adopted wireless technology than 5G. And I think the next probably would be called 6G probably more or more likely we will be slower to adapt in Canada than other places in the world. But still the revenue comes more from wireless than the local telephone. And then there's this internet, which accounts for about 27% of the ICT revenue or the telecommunication revenue. And the rest is long distance and whatnot. So again, um, our share of wireless probably is less than what you would be seeing in China, that your con you would see that the telecommunication revenue, a bigger share would come from wireless, primarily because the landlines were not put in place as ubiquitously there 50 years ago or 100 years ago as, as it was in China. So that became, as it was in Canada, so that became a good thing for China and other Asian countries. They leapfrogged into the wireless world faster. And the revenues um, um, in Canada are growing from, you could see the revenue we have. Uh, this is the revenue in uh, in wireless telecommunication. Um, I would say it's growing, but it's not growing as dramatically as you would see in other countries, but still wireless telecommunication is growing. And the reason it's growing is probably, I would make an assumption here, is the growth of the population. It's not that they are new products or whatnot. Canada is growing through immigration. And you could see that as more people come in, probably this revenue would, gener would increase, um, not because of, innovation, but just because of the size of the market. So how many internet users in there? Now you would see this comparison with China that uh, there are billions, hundreds of millions of internet users in China, but we, on the other hand, uh, we have about 36 million. Again, in a nation of 40 million, if you have 36 million independent users, um, then and that's probably commercial and, um, and individuals, um, that's a good thing. So it's a very high penetration of information technology in Canada, especially the internet. With a nation of 40 million, if you have 36 million um, internet users, that means a very high concentration. So yes, the size is small in terms of the actual number of users. But again, it's very highly concentrated. On the other hand, you may have hundreds of millions of users in China, but the penetration would not be as high in terms of percentage as it is in, in, in Canada. But again, you could see here uh, the impact of COVID-19 that the number of users went down. It's probably um, the, the commercial users, not necessarily the individual users. But again, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing here. A, a very brief picture of the comp companies in competition. Uh, the number of companies in information technologies is in Canada, you could see there are about 45,000 companies. So that number is not growing that fast, but still uh, from 2016, it was 39,000 to 45,000. So you must think that there's a very rich, la large landscape of um, companies. But actually, if you look at the breakdown, you will see that bulk of them are in software and computer services, uh, almost like 85%, 90% of the companies are in, in, um, in, in, in this sector of software and communication services, ICT, wholesaling, and manufacturing, there is a very small number of companies, less than 10%. And most of these companies, and this is what's more interesting, are smaller firms, one to nine employees. So if I'm just eyeballing it here, 90% of the companies in the ICT sector in Canada are just one to nine employees. So I think this is too far at sort of an atomized distribution and dispersed distribution of talent across Canada, which may, uh, I would I would wager a guess here that that would probably be a reason for not much innovation happening here. You need scale, you need large firms, you need cross-pollination of ideas. It cannot happen at this very small scale. So it's very atomized, small scale companies dominating the industry in terms of labor force. But, actually, but the innovation is still happening with the larger firms that have um, over a hundred Plus employees. So there are firms like Rogers and, and Talus and Bell that have very large workforces, but the bulk of the industry is in, in smaller, smaller sized firms, which I believe is not conducive for innovation. Now, I'm reaching the end of my presentation, and I'm going to briefly talk about uh, what is happening in the AI world. You, you're all familiar with the large language models, and we are very proud that one of our own, uh, Professor Jeffrey um, Hinton from University of Toronto, who is also uh, formerly from uh, Google or Alphabet, was recently awarded, co-awarded a Nobel in, in physics for his contribution to large language models um, and generative AI. And you're already familiar with OpenAI. I'm very big 
proponent of the use of open AI, of uh, generative AI in all sorts of innovation, in all sorts of creative um, activity, in all sorts of applications in business, because it 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 is transformative in its ability to do good. And and the just look at the pattern recognition part of generative AI and just keep the lang large language models for a second on the side, but let's look at machine learning uh, to its core and let's look at deep neural network um, applications. Um, if you have a, a billion scans, uh, MRI scans, or hundreds of millions of MRI scans, and they were used for diagnosis at one point in time and say, well, okay, this looks like a cancerous growth. This may not look like a cancerous growth. And then we always make mistakes. There are false positives where there was no cancer and we said cancer, and there's false negatives where we, we the doctor or the medical expert said there's no cancerous growth, but in fact, there was one. But imagine if all this data is in... Uh, is in much big uh, repositories, and we have deep learning algorithms that continues to reevaluate as they learn more. They go back and reclassify, and they go. And this continuously happens with hundreds of millions of 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 scans, MRI scans, or other scans, because machines don't get tired. They can keep scoring, keep reevaluating those scans. And perhaps we'll be able to go back to people whom we told last year, this is not a cancerous growth. And we say, well, wait a second, our computers have just realized that there was a mistake. This is cancerous growth. Let's treat this now. It's better to treat early than later. So you could just see that how deep learning, which is at the core of generative AI, because of machines, they're unrelenting. They don't get tired. They can keep evaluating, keep producing results. So I'm quite quite uh, a big proponent of using artificial intelligence, not just large language models, which are fascinating. You can have conversations with them. And if you are a business and you want to provide service to your customers, you can have your large language models trained on a, on a, on a restricted um, scope of conversations, but they can provide feedback. So uh, i give you an example of uh, in India, for instance, they have these call centers. So in, in North America, if I want to call my bank and I say, hey, I need help, someone in India would pick up the phone and, and answer it because it's cheaper to run call centers abroad. The problem is when it's 9 a.m. or let's say when it's, uh, um, it's uh, 6 p.m. here in Canada, it's about 10, 10 uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, um, it's uh, 4 a.m. In, uh, in the morning in, in India. So whoever is picking up the phone in India is not sleeping at their natural time. And why? Because that answer, uh, because they're answering calls and it's cheaper for banks in Canada or businesses in Canada to put the call centers in India. And the problem is that people are making money in India, yes, but they're also sacrificing their health. If you replace or, or augment your call centers with generative AI, you will then prevent people from losing their sleep. And yes, they may have to do other jobs because that job will be gone. But at the same time, we wouldn't be forcing people to work at three in the morning or four in the morning because generative AI will allow us to use bots or other technologies to answer the com most common questions people ask. So there's scope for tremendous innovation. There's scope for health, there's scope for customer service, and I'm a big proponent on, of AI. And um, so as I already mentioned, the there will be job displacements. Um, people um, who will learn to work with AI will keep their jobs and people who will not probably will have to do something else. Um, they, we will have to reskill the workforce and that was the primary reason I wrote that book, Getting Started with Data Science. The first page was we need to retrain. And I think that retraining and reskilling will never get old. And at no stage in your life that you will have, you'll feel that you, you've learned enough and you don't need to learn anymore. And I think that the way these technologies are coming in at the pace this innovation is happening, um, as you graduate from the university, you will continue to be fully aware of the fact that learning doesn't stop when you graduate from the university. So there will be tremendous gain across the sectors, but then we have to be mindful of it. Lastly, in Canada, we are very happy that we have very high concentration and penetration of digital technologies, but we still have deserts, digital deserts, there's a digital divide. We have very good internet services or ex access to, uh, to the internet in urban areas, but as soon as we go two hours out of the city, you could see that the telecommunication network becomes weaker, the quality of signals get weaker, the ability, so, so here, where I'm speaking from in Mississauga, a city right next to Toronto, um, I have a one, 
uh, gigabyte internet connection. But if I just travel two hours to a city, a small town called Gravenhurst, uh, it goes down to 25 megs per second. And if I go further, it even goes down to five megs. So imagine from one gigabyte, uh, uh, one gigabit connection to 25 to five megs. So there is like, as you're aware, uh, as you're farther away from cities, um, you get poorer services. So that is a discrimination in the way that if you're going to school in smaller towns, you may not have the ready, big live access. And same, you wouldn't have the same 5G quality um, um, technology to your, to your cell phone sims and whatnot. So there has to be an e e um, equality of opportunity for all citizens, irrespective of them living in big cities or small cities. So that digital divide has to be conquered. And there are also this connection of this, because we are so used to having our cell phones and everything, they, they, we are giving up a lot of information um, uh, to, to private companies. So if you have, if you use Google Maps or something similar, they know your location, your cell phone company knows your location and it pings you all the time. So yes, there are benefits to it, but you're also losing a lot of privacy and there has to be information provided to you, especially the young people as to what you are giving up when you take a selfie and put up on, on Instagram or whatnot, how much of it remains, how much of it dissolves in the ether. You have to be very mindful of it because it would have lifelong repercussions. And then how do you regulate it? The ethics of it, the, the um, digital rights. If I'm making this video and I'm giving it away, am I giving it away for everyone to use it? Uh, or is it that my intent is that someone who would like to use it can use it, but with my permission? And all of this is new and it will be um, discussed and debated in the future. So I think this um, brings me to my last remarks. This is my last slide, is that there's been a historical evolution of technology getting into our lives, the first industrial revolution, the second industrial revolution, and then the digital revolution. And it, it has just started. I mean, this, this whole thing has been only 200, 300 years old, and the digital revolution is just, what, 50 years old. I think by the time you, the young listeners to this podcast or this this, this conversation, when they will get a chance to see this um, in their lifetime, the technologies that will be there in 10, 20, 30, 50 years will be even more transformative. So be prepared for a world that will be a lot different from what it is now. And the Canadian workforce will change, so will Chinese workforce. You have to be adapted to the changes that are coming your way. I'm going to stop sharing here, and I'm going to say it has been a pleasure. It's been a distinct pleasure of uh, speaking um, with with uh, with you, and I hope that you reach out to me in my email um, if if you think this is interesting and if you want to be interested in coming to Ted Rogers School of Management at the Toronto Metropolitan University. Do give us a call. Our websites are um, have our numbers, and we look forward to hearing from you. And thank you for uh, inviting me to speak.